and there's a praise and worship band, and there's lights, and there's smoke machine, and whatever. And um, the net team comes out and does a skit to a Coldplay song where it's basically somebody saying, somebody's evangelizing someone, and then some guy comes out and beats them up and drags them away. And this is going on in front of the Holy Eucharist. Ladies and gentlemen, I just had a great conversation with my friend Joe Gallagher. He works with the Coalition for Canceled Priests, which is running uh, the conference coming up later this week that I'll be a speaker at, along with many others. And we talk mainly about the debate surrounding the SSPX and, and why is that something that people harp on so much, as well as our experiences in the charismatic renewal. And we both share some stories, so please... Have a little patience as we go through some of the things we saw during the charismatic renewal, which for a lot might be an eye opener. Um, and if you are someone who is in the charismatic renewal, please listen with an open heart and an open mind and understand that um, these comments have nothing to do with persons and instead have to do with the faith. And just before we get to the show here, we are having a massive sale in the TKR store. Our frankincense oil is $50 off. While supplies last, um, we're almost out. Our lanolin balm and frankincense combo are also on sale. And uh, again, this is $50 or more off, depending on what you buy. You can find the links for that in the description. This sale will last as long as supplies last or for the next 10 days or so of the month of June. All right. Enjoy the show. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Kennedy Hall here with our good friend, Joe Gallagher, who is a... Actually... What is your official title with the Coalition of Canceled Priests? Well, sure. Um, I, I actually, I, I run my own company. And okay. so I contract with the Coalition in handling a lot of their communications and uh, production services. Okay. So they are just one of a handful of clients. Okay, so Joe Gallagher is in communications and production. And he is currently working with the Coalition for Canceled Priests. I've been communicating with them back and forth. Uh, with Father Lovell getting ready for this um, conference coming up just this uh, week, actually, as we record this, this is Monday afternoon, it'll air either later today or Tuesday. And um, I'm going to be heading down to the Coalition to Cancel Priests second annual conference. My speech is on Saturday. I'm very excited among many others are going to be there. John Henry Weston, uh, you know, uh, Jesse Romero, Liz Yor, Brian McCall, Eric Sammons, uh, Father Altman and others that I'm forgetting. Uh, David Dahl Gray, for example, it's going to be action packed. It's quite a lineup. And but Joe and I have been getting to know each other, and he spent time uh, going to Steubenville University and was in the Charismatic Rule. Now, would probably say whether he calls himself a traditional Catholic per se or not, definitely enjoys the traditional Catholic faith. And um, we have been chatting about the SSPX, our history, both being in the charismatic renewal and so forth. So we thought we would just sort of chat about that. So first things first, Joe, what was your score on the SAT? No, I'm just kidding. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> and you are young. How young are you? Oh, man. When people ask me that, I usually respond with saying that I'd rather tell them my social security number instead of <laughs> sharing my age. But uh, I'm 26. Okay, that's not that bad. Yeah, that's fine. No, not um, too bad. You're, uh, is that, what is that? That's not a millennial. I'm a millennial. I'm 35. I think I'm on the, the higher side of millennials. Are you a millennial or, or the one under me? I am right at the beginning of Gen Z, depending on which, you know, blog you read about the, uh, the generation rankings. So I'm right, right at the beginning of Gen Z. So you know what? There is a stark divide in the generations. I used to be a teacher and my first year teaching high school, I taught elementary school for a time, but then I was in high school. I was, let me think here. I was 27, I think. And um, the class that I had, that grade 12 class that year, they were still born in the 90s because this was 2015, 2016. And they were like a different species. They were born like 97, 98. They were like a different species yeah. from the kids in the same grade that I taught two or three years later. It was like I had more in common with them. And then two or three years later, it was like dealing with a different animal. This is totally off topic, it has nothing to do with Catholicism. Do you find that you see a generational divide with people yourself and maybe just a couple, three years younger? Oh, for sure. Yeah, 97 is the year I was born. I graduated in 2015 from high school. So 
but yeah, I, I honestly, I, I also find a little bit of a generational divide between people my age. <laughs> Just, I mean, that does tie into the to the faith, but oh, for sure, there there is a massive shift, I think, in the upbringing of uh, my generation. The guys that are you know mid twenties. And then people that are just starting to turn 21, 22, graduating college, you know, mm -hmm. that's really, you started to see a massive influx in how many people played uh, computer games. Of course, you have Minecraft, the PS4 comes out. There's a lot less coming outside and, you know, scraping your knee and then going inside when the it's time for dinner. And that, mm -hmm. so I was like right on the shift of that. So it's totally different. There seems to be, uh, I'll go on and on, but long story short, oh yeah. Yeah, I don't have a scientific reason for this, but I remember one day thinking, because I when I taught elementary school, I was teaching. I was teaching French well, in Canada. We teach French from grade you know one and and up, and I was teaching just this elementary school French, and I one time had the grade fours or fives, whatever it was. This was in 2014, and I had them in the library, and. I had a very simple, I thought, task, which was basically, here's a bunch of questions. You're going to use Google and find the answer. <laughs> Pretty simple. And I, had I booked a library computer lab. And because when I was in grade six, I remember going to the local library and looking up something on the internet. This would have been like 1999, 2000. And I remember bringing a pen and paper with me, looking the thing up. It was a biography on Jackie Robinson, I remember. And I remember writing it down by hand and then memorizing that for a speech. That was normal for me in grade six. These kids, I remember I was in the library and they said to me, Mr. Hall, the computer's not giving me the answer. Google's not telling me the right answer. I don't know how to do this. And I thought, oh my goodness, there's uh, Houston, we have a problem. There's a massive, uh, a massive divide. Anyway. No, okay. Sure. So you um, and I were talking on Twitter and uh, you had brought up how you know, this whole SSPX debate, uh, of all the things that we could be debating, it seems futile that people spend so much negative energy on it. Do you want to expand on your thoughts behind that? Sure. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I grew up really having, uh, I, I, I don't know how, how best to say it, but I think that I was always a very confrontational lad. Um, I was never really much of a, a peacekeeper or peacemaker in you know middle school, high school. I was still finding my way and figuring it out the first half of college. That's for sure. God bless my poor mother. But um, <laughs> so for the longest time, and I know we'll dive into the charismatic aspect in a little bit here, but I really had a, a, a fundamental issue with uh, with people with opposing views almost to the point where I got, I was thinking the problem is the person, not their ideology. Right. But uh, after I started my, my company helping out different Catholic or conservative entities, by the way, shout out if anybody has any questions about that, it's okay if I give a, tell people. Yeah. yeah tell me, out. we'll put the link in the description. So what, tell us exactly what the company's called. Oh, AMG moon, AMG okay. moon dot com and you can just check it out send send me an email joe at amgmoon.com and uh we'll, we're happy to help anybody out that uh is wanting to to grow their content better their content look at their strategy of how they release things or market but i digress but after i after i i started my own thing and i began working with different catholic entities it was really like a like a, a breath of fresh air because i'm i began starting to really think for my think for myself and really understanding and becoming uh, more reflective on the faith. And at my time, I used to work at Church Milton. Before I left uh, Church Milton, I, I ran their activist group called The Resistance. And I was really, really hell-bent on figuring out, okay, what is the problem? Because so easily, if you go on Gab or even Twitter or Parler before it, you know, Gab started to be not great, uh, people would attack the other people, you know, make fun of Joe Biden, make fun of Nancy Pelosi. And I think that, of course, there's going to be some humor in that. But at the end of the day, when you consider the Catholic faith on, well, Jesus Christ wants Joe Biden in heaven too. And to push it even further, if Joe Biden 
were to really attack his faith. And, and, and when I say that, I mean like embrace it. If you were to really become a solid, solid Orthodox Catholic, there's a chance that some of the Orthodox Catholics now have a lesser capacity for God than Joe Biden does. It's just a matter of whether or not he chooses to accept it. So this idea that, wow, if Joe Biden or Nancy Pelosi or you know, Chuck Schumer or Klaus Schwab, any of these guys, if they really chose to embrace the faith as she is, they could be holier than I. Um, it really, really opened my eyes. It was kind of, it was a really big watershed moment for me. Mm. And so it became the question of ideology. Ideology is the enemy. Who pushes that ideology? Well, of course, Satan and his minions, the demons, the fallen angels. And then, sorry, I know this is a little long-winded, Kennedy. Goes but after that, memory. thank you. Uh, after that, it, it just it wasn't too many steps to the point of, wow, this is it in the faith, too. We're all distracted arguing about issues that are, you know, in the upper echelon of the, the, of the uh, Catholic Church's uh, you know, theology or ecclesiology, whatever, whatever aspect of the faith. Meanwhile, the reason the Joe Bidens, the Nancy Pelosi's, the local Antifa member or your local drag queen, uh, their issues are much more fundamental. So we're wasting time going back and forth, talking about the issues up here. The example I use is that we're arguing about the best way to fix the broken window on the second story of our house. Meanwhile, all of the foundation is eroding. There's termites, there's cracks in the concrete, the, the metal beams are rusting, whatever we want to say. That's all slowly eroding. And we're too blind and too uh, emotionally charged to uh, to see it. And that's something that I really hope can change within Catholic media. Go to thekennedyreport.com and visit the TKR store to see our new products, Kennedy's Choice Beard Oil. You can use this on your beard to help with alleviating itchiness, dryness, and irritation of skin. And don't worry, no animals were used in testing this product except for myself. Use Kennedy's Choice Beard Balm for a softer, healthier, manageable beard that is made with natural ingredients. And trust me, I know a thing or two about beards. Visit thekennedyreport.com and check out the TKR store. The links for this are in the description. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, there's two sides. On the one hand, obviously, you know, shocker, everyone, I'm a SSPX guy. You can see the picture of Lefebvre right on the screen here with my book. That's no secret. But... One of the things I try to bring up, bring up to people when they start to debate or ask questions and things, it's like, listen, listen, listen. If you want to, you want to, you want to go to the depths and get into the canon law and get into the history and the ecclesiology and all these, those are good things. And of course, there's a reason why we have these things in the church, and they're there to serve the mission of the church, which is the salvation of souls, and and that's important. However, in 2023, this isn't 1988. This isn't July 1988 after the consecrations of the four bishops when it was a really confusing, chaotic situation. This isn't, uh, you know, 1975 uh, at the time of the suppression of the SSPX. We're talking about 2023, okay? This is more than uh, 50 years since the SSPX was formed. Uh, this is 35 years since the consecrations. The Pope of the Catholic Church for a long time now. I mean, Pope Francis has been Pope for 10 years. It's not just like, it seems like it was just yesterday. It's been 10 years. 10 years is a long time. The excommunications were recognized as uh, no longer binding in 2009. That's a long time. That's about 15 years ago, if my math is serves me correctly. Um, this is a long time. Where we stand now is that the Society of St. Pius X have recognized faculties from the Pope which you know, working with the canceled priests, not even suspended priests can have faculties. That's the point of suspension. So whatever you may think about them, they're Catholic. Whatever you may think about their theology, they're allowed to hear confessions and perform marriages and offer sacraments. And there's many other reasons. But the point is, is I don't know why anyone would spend any of their energy in 2023 going after the SSPX. Even, even if somebody believed they were like, like real schismatics. Like, let's just take the full narrative at face value. Let's just say all the stuff you've read and the anti-SSPX media was true for a time. Well, even if that were the case, 
we do have Catholics, millions of them in the church, who attend masses with priests who were formerly schismatics for like 400 years. They're called the Byzantines. And the Eastern Orthodox is in schism, admittedly on their own admission from the Catholic Church. And the Byzantine Catholics, I know there's various communions and they've come in different times. I'm just generalizing here. And, and I know it's not as simple as a 1054 schism. Don't at me, my ortho bros. I know there's lots and lots of little things, but just that's the date we all look to is 1054. So let's just take 1054. For a few hundred years, there were Greek Christians who were not in union with the Pope. And then at a certain point, they were. For The point being is they were formally schismatics for centuries. Yet no one would ever, I mean, I don't think anyone would ever say, well, I wouldn't associate with them because they were bad one time. So even if you believed the SSPX were bad for a time, there are no penalties. They have faculties. The Pope says they're not schismatics, as Bishop Wander recently said, and he is in a position to know. For those who don't know, um, Bishop Wander was tasked with working with the SSPX and actually has lived with him for the last four years. And he was public with the fact that Pope Francis told him personally that the SSPX are not schismatic. So this is from the Pope. So whatever has happened, we're at the position now where it's just really a non-issue. You want to debate the canonical status, irregular, whatever. I mean, sure, we're in a regular time in the church. Things are irregular. But nonetheless, it just seems so crazy to me that the SSPX are even counted as one of the problems. Why do you think that is? I have a bit of an anecdotal story. Um, <clears throat> I was in Washington, D.C., and when I was down there, I, had a, I have a couple of friends that live in the area. So we connected. We went out to a bar, had a couple beers, and they were just asking. We were just talking, you know, chopping it up as, as, as guys do, as friends do. And we started talking about the faith and evangelization. And what I ended up saying to them was, you know, guys, put plain and simply, the truth in and of itself is so good that by its very nature, it has a right to be shared with other people. It's so good. The most precious thing that we can ever have, we are obligated to give it away. And also the people that don't have the truth have a right to know it. Right. So in talking with them, I said, all of these guys here, everybody at this bar in Washington, DC, not a very conservative area. And admittedly, a lot of people do travel there too for work, politics and things like that. But I just pointed to the bar and I said, everybody here has a right to know the faith. And we have an obligation to go and share it. One plus one. Well, the only answer then is what are we doing drinking? and just chopping it up about this and that we can hop on the phone anytime let's actually get up out of our chairs and let's go just let's go talk with other people let's go share the faith and we did it was myself and uh, three other guys about my age and not once did we come across somebody say oh yeah you know uh i i haven't been to church in forever but man I, my big question is is pope francis really the pope or what about that SSPX, you know, or it's, yeah. it's a lot more fundamental, a lot more fundamental. So it's, I just think that it's a non-starter. I don't think I would be shocked and I would be shocked if anybody could even attempt to argue the fact that let's say you have somebody that, uh, you know, is Orthodox and they are, they say, all right, yeah, we don't, we, we reject the primacy of Peter, this, that, and the other. Are you telling me that the person that has, decided to do their research as a Greek Orthodox or as, as an Orthodox and um, in general. Uh, and they say, you know what? No, I, I think I'm going to stay Orthodox. Are you telling me that that person is damned? Are they as likely to, are, is their soul in just as much peril as somebody that's going to get a uh, gender reaffirming surgery? It's asinine. And if we're willing to make that concession when it comes to the Orthodox, yeah, it, it would be it. unbelievable to not make that same concession when it comes to somebody that chooses to attend the society. Now, again, sure. Do I, am I a pro society guy? No, but I don't want to waste my time talking about that with you. I'm not anti the SSPX. And when I say anti, I mean, if you go to the, a society chapel, I don't think you're going to go to hell. <laughs> I don't think you're in a state of mortal sin and you're receiving our Lord on, uh, uh, um, unworthily, but the Joe Bidens, uh, just as a good example, um, 
or you're, uh, you're active homosexual, those are the people that need the help. Those are the people that you need to talk to, and you are not going to be having conversations with them about these canonical concerns. And so it becomes a waste of time. And honestly, in my opinion, Kennedy, uh, it becomes almost counterintuitive to the mission that so many different Catholic media, and I do mean a lot, I'm not speaking about one in particular, it, it becomes counterintuitive to the mission. People become podcasters or commentators or activists or theologians or scholars because they want people to get to know Jesus Christ. And sure, will those conversations need to be had eventually? Sure. But not right now. Not right now. Hmm. Yeah, it comes down to the nature of the crisis. You know, um, the word crisis is it's a Greek word, and, and this is the pronunciation. It's very difficult. It's crisis. It's spelled the same. And um, it literally means a uh, moment in the disease where a decision has to be made or the disease will take the host. That's what it means. So mm -hmm. if you say we're in a crisis, it means if we don't act now, we're done. Uh, and a lot of people mis misuse the term and um, or misunderstand the term. A lot of people will admit we're in a crisis, but then not accept any action. <laughs> Or a lot of people will think that crisis means just something that's bad. But that's not really what it means. I mean, you know, if I have pneumonia, let's say, if I go to the doctor, it could or could not be a crisis. It would depend on the x-rays. You know, if they find a little bit and I'm healing from it, okay, it's okay. It's fine. You'll be fine. A little rest, you'll be okay. Maybe some penicillin if you need it. If I go to the doctor and they find that my lungs are completely filled with it and if I don't have, you know, a, a massive uh, intervention that I might stop breathing... Well, all of a sudden we're in a crisis. Same thing with cancer or whatever. And at that moment, the doctor may have to decide to do something drastic. It may, the doctor may have to decide to do something that will actually in some ways cause pain to some other part of me, but will stop me from dying. And that's the, that's, that's the, that is the um, situation that Catholics have been facing for 50 years is, um, you know, it was very clear to me in the beginning when I discovered this Society of St. Pius X, it was just a matter of, I was looking for a tradition for my family. My diocese, it doesn't get a lot of press, but you know, it may as well be run by Blaise Supic. You know, it, uh, it's a very bad diocese. There's very little anything that's resembling Catholic Orthodoxy in most of the places, and it's just bad. And I have uh, five, we're expecting our sixth child, and a few years ago, I just realized, I was like, well, I want my sons to be at least open to the call to the priesthood. I want my daughters to uh, be open to the religious life as a sister. And it's just simply not going to happen if they see Father Bob lip syncing to gather us in, you know, as the uh, lady in the pantsuit carries the gifts up. It's just not going to happen. You know, there's just there, no one is going to want to take the faith seriously if it doesn't look serious. So for me, it was very simple. The crisis, whatever it is to somebody else, for me, was very real. And um, I had to make a decision. And that's pretty much the, and that's, that's the decision that Catholics have had to make time and time again for the, la the last few decades. And people should also, not, should also not confuse my meaning. When I say have to make a decision, if we go back to the analogy of the physician, if he decides to kill the person, that's a bad decision. <laughs> but you do, yeah. so, you do something that is one of the options that otherwise wouldn't be acceptable. Like cutting off somebody's limb is not acceptable if he doesn't have gangrene. If he has gangrene, cutting off his limb is fine. Shooting him in the head is not. When it comes to something like the Society of St. Pius X, historically, uh, bishops have been consecrated without papal mandate. It was like that for the first thousand years, basically. So it's not intrinsic to the church to do it the way we do it now. So whatever one may think about what they would do in a situation, somebody makes a different decision based on a crisis, but that's the decision they make. Um, to, for people to continually harp on it, I find is, I don't know, I find it very strange. Especially, there's another thing too, is one of the biggest claims people make against the SSPX and folks like myself is that they want unity in the church. And um, I get that. Um, uh, but then they just continually go after other Catholics. I've never really understood that. There's a sort of hypocrisy to it. What do you think about that? Um, no, I, I think there's, there's two points that can be raised here. Um, there's a lot of 
good benefits and reasons that, of course, Latin is the universal language of the church and things are uh, 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 always made official when the Latin translation comes out. Okay. Well, yeah. what, are, what are some of the fruits of that? Well, um, actually, in, in some instances, there's a lot of Catholic scholars that, well, not a lot because it's a very small amount of people that have the ability to do it. But the fact that there will be priests or theologians that will blog or write or publish their works in Latin so as to not scandalize the faithful. That's, that's point one, because there's some things that are, frankly, above my head and above everybody's head that is reserved for people that have the authority to do so and the capacity of mind to, uh, to do so. But also, when speaking of, your, the, uh, of crisis, when Catholics are talking about the issues in the church, are the stats that are crisis worthy, the ones where people are choosing to go to, uh, to leave the Novus Ordo and go to ICK or the FSSP or the SSPX? Or is it, holy cow, 17% of Catholics don't even believe in the real presence? That's the, that's the issue. So every single- 70? 17 don't or 17 do forgive me yeah yeah, yeah. 17 yeah. percent do believe in the real presence that's my bad um thank you for for checking me on that so every time a person is on youtube or rumble or on a a, a news article something pops up in their in in their content aggregator whatever the platform is and they're like oh okay yeah i'll watch this this looks catchy what a nice thumbnail what a cool title and they're talking about things that go over the head Mm -hmm. But what that person, a majority of Catholics need to hear is simple catechesis on the real presence. Yeah. It's, it's wasting the time and it's antithetical to every Catholic apostle, its mission, every single one. If you're out here to save souls, then you need to look at what are the fundamental issues yeah. and start approaching those. That's, that's my take. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, there's a lot of. Non not I don't know if it was nonsensical, but very complicated jargon that gets thrown around about these topics. Um, and no one listening to these podcasts understands it at all. Because um, yeah. most people don't understand it. You know, I realize, for example, you know, living here in Canada, especially during the lockdown stuff, um, I had made the decision to go to the SSPX before the lockdown, but during the lockdown, it was... I was probably going for about a year, year and a half before that, but it, it, it really solidified certain things just because of the, the depth of the crisis in the sacramental, the offering of the sacraments and so forth, and the depth of the crisis in Canada just amplified things. And um, But I had to cover some of these cases for uh, working for LifeSite News. I had to cover some of these cases of doctors being brought up against tribunals. And they're sort of like these pseudo-legislative bodies who... Um, they're not, they're not legally binding like a regular court of law, but they're almost like arbitration, if that makes sense. And, mm -hmm. But they have lawyers, and they're arguing. And, and there's these doctors that resisted the mandates, resisted all the COVID stuff, you know, vaccines, masks, whatever. And then there's the College of Doctors who is very communist. And I would watch the lawyer argue on behalf of the College of Doctors that the doctor who resisted was, you know, in medical terms, was a heretic. And he transgressed all of these lines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would, I would watch the defense of the lawyer who was defending the doctor who had acted, in my opinion, justly. And he would use some legal stuff because he could, but his ultimate claim was always the spirit of the law is X, Y, and Z. The constitution of the country is supposed to be understood like this. And it was like these two, basically, it was like the leftists were arguing completely using the letter of the law, whereas the let's call them conservatives, were focused on the spirit of the law uh, and how it was supposed to be fulfilled. And I find often watching these podcasts when people go after traditionalists and so forth, it's a lot of, um, I would call it, I would be honest, I would call it borderline pharisaical in the sense of just sort of like when you argue with a Calvinist, they just throw citations from the Bible at you and you don't really know how to respond. Um, and they're sort of missing the bigger picture. But um, okay, I wanted to transition because you're talking about evangelizing people in a bar. You sound like someone who must have gone to Steubenville because that's something <laughs> that <laughs> that would happen in a situation like that. So uh, I know you've talked about, I think you were talking to Father, or if not Father, uh, Dr. Brian McCall, and um, about um, sort of your experience going from a charismatic leaning person, 
Obviously, Steubenville is it's not officially charismatic. I know there's many people there that don't get really deep into the renewal, but nonetheless, it's very common. You went from sort of a charismatic fella to now being more in the traditional sphere. Do you want to talk about that transition? Or, or I guess, like, did you grow up someone who was deep in the charismatic renewal? Was it like, was it, was it tongue? I mean, I was in the charismatic renewal. I never did the speaking in tongues thing because by God's grace, I always believed that if it was a real thing, it would just happen and I would never try. So I would never try because I'm like, well, that's not a gift. I mean, that's just my imagination. Um, right. Were you in the situations where everyone's going on and on in different tongues and laying hands? Did you, did you, were you ever in those sort of uh, atmospheres? No. So, uh, no, I was not. Um, I would say the best way is, you know, getting getting to Franciscan, um, was, I, I gave it a chance. I, I, I could not say that, you know, I was ever all in. And there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, I, I went to a couple talks and, you know, I would ask questions and I would learn more about it. And, and you know, some of the things just didn't, didn't resonate with me. I went in with an open mind. I went to a couple of festivals of praise. Um, yes. I remember, I remember one that I went to down at Stuby, uh, and this one was in the, uh, they were, it was an exposition of the blessed sacrament. So the priest was carrying around our Lord and, I started crying and I think some of my friends thought that I was just being very, I was moved by the spirit. You just got hit with but the Holy ghost, man. I was crying because we weren't sitting in the silence. Right. I was crying because I felt like our Lord deserves more than for us to be emotionally charged with music as he's gallivanted around by a priest. Yeah. And, um, I mean that respectfully. I, I really do, and I, I don't want to. I don't want anybody to, who's in the charismatic movement to uh, think that I uh, imagine that they were doing something immoral. I'm not a moral theologian, and I definitely don't have a set stance on it. But for me personally, it broke my heart because all I could think about was, "I come to you in the silence. God is in the silence. God is in the silence." And when you are at mass or you're at adoration, those are times where. You're supposed to sit and listen. I, Fulton Sheen, one of many uh, great Catholic figures, God willing, soon to be saint, we'll find out, um, talked about how you need at least 15 minutes in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And this is a guy who went every day. You need 15 minutes in front of the Blessed Sacrament just to decompress from the world. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to let God in in an intellectual, logical way when you have noise and i don't mean noise in a, in a negative or derogatory term i just i mean it just as that sound noise distractions and it's also it's also closely intertwined i i think you know you look at you know as the church tradition talks about the the, the three ways of the spiritual life you know you the unitive way reaching union you're you're not really paying attention to the beauty of the trees or the beauty of music or the beauty of relationships the way that we know of it and so when you're trying when you're beholding the creator face to face or i'm sorry well in the in the uh, under the the uh, the species of the uh, of the bread of the host when you when you're spending time with him like that you really shouldn't have any of those lower distractions in That's my right. opinion yeah and so it's just, it's, it's crazy how all of it's intertwined. It's almost like you need an eternity to understand the entirety of the faith. But um, that was that was tough for me. That was one part. And another aspect was, I remember I went to a talk and I'm picking the brain of one of the presenters. And I said, okay, so speaking in tongues, and, uh, she, how do you get to that point? And she genuinely, God, God bless her. I think that it was definitely out of no malintent. I uh, said, practice in the closet yes, and I've just heard that. practice utterances. And I think of any of the other gifts that were bestowed on the apostles. And I don't think that they were practicing in their closets or behind closed doors, get up and walk or, you know, yeah. go sin no more. I, I have sight, rise from the dead. I don't think that those were the converse the, the practicings. I think what they were doing was speaking with God, praying to Jesus Christ, saying, I cannot wait to see you again after he ascended. 
being filled with the Holy Spirit is not necessarily something that comes with noise. It, there's a lot more peace to it than that. And it's the person that's most peaceful, I mean, picture a peaceful, a, pe a peaceful image in somebody's mind is a sunset or still water. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not a strumming guitar around a campfire. Is it good? Yeah, it's not intrinsically wrong, but I think that that's just a stepping stone to a higher aspect of the spiritual life. Yeah, this reminded me, I just wrote it down. So I'll tell you a story. Um, the high school that I worked at, there were some Steubenville people, graduates, this is in Canada, but Steubenville graduates are like, um, it's like Protestant church planters, you know, they go around and they sort of try to start, start up these things. And when you've met one, you're going to meet like 10 more, you know, I've literally never even been to, oh, actually I've driven through Ohio, but I've never been through, to Steubenville. And, um, but I know 15 to 20 graduates because you, again, you meet one, you meet them all. And, um, I should also say, I am going to be critical of certain things, the charismatic renewal here, but I do have an eternal debt of gratitude to renewal ministries, um, who ran the mission where I had a, a conversion back to the church in, in, uh, in 2015 at Guadalupe. So, so I am, I am very grateful. Nonetheless, when I started getting deep into the faith, deeper into the faith, I was asked to be on these prayer teams for this festival of praise that was going to be at our high school. I think I went to two or three. And again, when you're in the Novus Ordo, you, a lot of the time, there's really nothing there. Meaning you go to your local parish and it's just the banal liturgy, the chicken soup for the soul sermon. Um, nothing is, you know, nothing is reverent, whatever. So, you know, you're, you're looking for the fire. You're looking for a deeper understanding of the faith. And what is often the case is, you know, because there is, this is one thing that's, that's very interesting about the charismatic renewal. Because lay people can't do priestly things, it's almost like they, they try, try to amplify all the things that lay people can do to fill the gap. So what can lay people do? They can get together and they can pray. Okay, let's get together and let's pray crazy. You know, what can they do? They can, they can sing. They can, they can praise God. Let's really praise God. This is, I think, this is, I, I, I would say from a good place, this is what attracts people to the charismatic renewal because they're not getting it at mass. They're not getting it in their classes, et cetera. So they have to find it somewhere else. So I was like that. And, you know, charismatic friends were like, well, hey, come to this thing. And I'm like, okay, I want, I want serious Catholicism. And these people seem serious. So I'll be open to it and I'll go to it, whatever. I also had no formation growing up. So I didn't know the difference between anything. So I go to this um, meetings and stuff for the Festival of Praise. And at one of the Festival of Praise events, it was Net Ministries, and um, they're very charismatic, of course, and they were hosting the event or, or helping to facilitate it. And the monstrance, Christ is out there on the altar in a high school gym, and there's a praise and worship band, and there's lights, and there's smoke machine, and whatever. And um, the Net team comes out and does a skit. And uh, what happens is... is um, Coldplay, that song, I don't even know what the song's called, whatever, it's one of their famous ones. And the skit being done in front of the Eucharist yeah. is just a pantomime, right, to a Coldplay song where it's basically somebody saying, somebody's evangelizing someone and then some guy comes out and beats them up and drags them away. And this is going on in front of the Holy Eucharist. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, like, it can't be that in the early church or basically all the times before the 20th century, it can't be that the way that evangelization took place was through basically, you know, God bless them, but theater kids who were just, doing like that's just it just seemed to me that this this what's happening right here this is not catholic this is not again you mentioned for example the music isn't intrinsically evil no of course not you know people sing folk songs and they can sing you know praise and worship music assuming the lyrics are not unorthodox you can sing these things you can enjoy these things it, it brings you some happiness and that's all great but it's not sacred you know if you look back to um the time of uh, St. Philip Neri and Palestrina. 
So people, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, St. Philip Neri was at Palestrina's bedside when he died. They were close friends. And Palestrina is credited with saving polyphony. Polyphony is when you hear that beautiful music you hear at a traditional Latin mass, that's not the chant, but the polyphony, so the six or seven or eight voices all singing different parts. Basically, the Pope at the time, I think it was Marcellus, one of them, and um, he was going to ban choral music in churches all over the world. He was going to universally condemn and ban it because even that good music, a cappella, sacred sounding, was becoming distracting and they were getting too big for their britches using this in the mass. So you think to yourself, that's, I mean, think of the music you hear today in a Nova Sordo. They were going to ban choral music and have only Gregorian chant. So um, Palestrina had one shot and he was given the chance to make a mass. I think it's, 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 it's a famous mass called um, Misa Papa Marcellis or something like that. You can look it up. It's his famous mass. And it was like, here's your shot. And you can basically save polyphony. It's one of the most achingly beautiful musical pieces ever written. It was incredible. It, 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 it impressed the Pope and so forth. But that became the standard. So even sacred music can be done in a way that doesn't fulfill the purpose of the church. And um, so I think people need to keep that in mind. The charismatic renewal, the intentions of people can be great. The desire of the missionaries or whatever and so forth can be completely pure. But because of a lack of formation, a lack of traditional formation, there are things that are okay that in years past would have been seen it would have been seen as sinful in the insofar as they were liturgical abuses. What do you say to that? I agree. Um, you know, it's uh, it makes me think of um, again a couple of things. I feel like there's so many different ways we could go with this uh, this discussion, Kennedy. Again, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. It really speaks. It really speaks to the personal aspect of the faith, in my opinion. I when people talk about all these macro issues. And, you know, whether it be the SSPX question or the globalist question with Klaus Schwab or even on the diocesan level or the family level. Uh, in all of those things, the the answer to what can I do about it is the same. And that is for you as a person to continue, you general, royal you, uh, to grow in holiness to spend as much time as you can praying and to spend as so much as much time as you can learning. Of course, different vocations allow for different ways that's practiced and different amounts of time that you can you know, adhere to it. I have a four year old little girl. I can't be reading about you know, the history of the rosary and uh, or uh, reading the interior castle when she wants to learn her letters or you, Kennedy. Congratulations on the, the sixth little one coming along. It's different. But the whole the whole point is what can I do to change the world? What can I do uh, to bring more um, reverence to the mass is all the same. And it is for me, Joe, or you, Kennedy, or anybody else to control oneself through an increase in virtue and to focus on our Lord. The, all of these different aspects, as and is the perfect example is what you're saying. Even some of the sacred music can be distracting. Well, the question is, oh, well, then what do you have? The, the, the answer should be the best that you can give or that you can set up. But the one thing you have full control of, we have full control of, is ourselves, our will, and how we choose to be present at Mass. I'm talking with Professor McCall, because Father Lovell allowed me to be a co-host, invited me to, to co-host with him on his program, Hope in the Desert, which is great. I, I If I do say so myself, I, I hear the producer's a pretty good guy. But, um, He's all right. He's not bad. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, whole, the whole argument is today, I just don't get anything out of, out of mass. Yeah, I right. get something out of the charismatic renewal. Well, here's the thing. At adoration or at mass, that's the one time or the few times a week where you are supposed to give. We don't take at those times. You grow in holiness, as Professor McCall astutely pointed out and eloquently said, you still get graces even when you give. That shows how charitable and good our God is, first of all. 
the fact that even when he says, give me all that you have, and you do, even in that action of giving, you're receiving tenfold. If you just choose to give first, to pay that homage, to worship, um, the return is fantastic. And you'll find it most when you feel nothing. That's the craziest part of it all. And I wish, I, I think I'm going to have to actually design the graphic in Photoshop and, um, and make it so I can start sharing whenever um, somebody is gracious enough to have me on. But I picture the charismatic renewal or somebody who's simply of goodwill, kind of your, consider your typical American patriot or in Canada, the uh, men and women that fought back against the measures of the COVID lockdowns. They just see something is fundamentally wrong here. Yeah. And that sends them on this journey of looking for the truth. And if you were to picture truth kind of being the Y axis, although there's, uh, and then uh, there's these, almost like these, uh, like these bumpers as if you were bowling, pointing up. So this is the progression of time. And you start like here in the part of the triangle. You're like, okay, I really want to learn the truth. If you keep trying to learn the truth, and that's truly what somebody's going after, and you discover God, you hit, but then the bumper, God's grace, his re revelation of himself to you and his personal pursuit after you, which he has with every single one of us, he's going to guide you a little bit. And then you're going to keep going like, okay, charismatic renewal. This is great. I'm, I'm learning God on an emotional level. I can yeah. almost feel him. Okay. Over time, you're going to get bumped again. And then you're going to keep going and going until you find the truth. And I think you'll get to that middle line at the, the apex of that triangle and that middle line, that perfectly balanced way is found in tradition. I, I'm convinced of it because it's intellectual and it's supplemented by the emotional, but it's primarily intellectual. That's the most important aspect. And I think one of the biggest messages for anybody that's really looking at the comparison between a more charismatic lifestyle and a traditional one. It's not that we're all super disciplined and you know, we're just not feeling and we don't have fun and, and laugh. It's that the most important thing in this life is to learn it's knowledge it's the truth jesus doesn't say i am your emotions he says i'm the truth that's an intellectual ascent and so if you make that your priority the emotions will fall into place every single time yeah and it's you know it's it's not good to be emotional all the time you know like that's that's one thing you know i've got some stories i could tell like um well let's put it this way um if someone loses their reason and is acting in a way that's if, outside of the faith, if they're just acting in a way that's basically erratic or just emotional, you would say that person's lost control. So it doesn't make any sense that if you go to a prayer meeting, a festival of praise, whatever you want to call it, and everyone just sort of gets into it and is just acting in all these sorts of ways where if you saw them acting that way, in a grocery store, you'd probably call the loony bin because what you would, like if you saw somebody acting like that in a certain place, then you would say, well, something's wrong here. It doesn't make sense to me that that would be a manifestation and the basis of your spiritual life. And that would be from God because you have to have control over, you have to, you have to, you have to use your will and your intellect in order to ascend deeper and deeper into the spiritual life. Now, I know the, the contrary opinion to that would be something like in the Acts of the Apostles, it talks about them, the people thought they were intoxicated. And that's the, after the descent of the Holy Ghost. Well, even let's just take that for a second. The Holy Ghost descended at Pentecost on the Apostles. I'm not an Apostle. You're not an Apostle. I wasn't in the upper room with the Virgin Mary. Even if there was something like a, a exuberant joyfulness that made people look as if they were intoxicated in the sense that they were just so joyful or, or happy. Um, there are certain things that happen to some people and don't happen to other people. <laughs> there are certain things that happen to prophets in the Old Testament, Moses, you know, Christ himself, the apostles, martyrs and saints. Certain things happen to these saints that don't happen to us, and they've always been that way. And on the other hand, it does not mean that they were acting like you would at a charismatic prayer re renewal revival thing. I mean, that's just, it's, that might be lost in translation a little bit for the way that it's presented. But if we lose control of our reason and we become emotional, this, in my opinion, is a fertile breeding ground for demonic activity. And 
I'll give an example. Now, I don't just mean the, the Hollywood stuff. I just mean the intellectual side, because the way that Satan primarily comes after us is through the intellect, is through temptation and through the intellect. People look at these movies and they think, oh, someone's possessed if their head's spinning around on its axis. Okay, that's a Hollywood thing. And I guess things like that apparently do happen. I've never seen it, but they say it does. Fine. But I remember one time I was sitting in a planning event for one of these charismatic festivals. And... It was mostly women because there was a huge female presence in the charismatic renewal, which in a leadership thing in the church is not normal and is not is not uh, Catholic. It just isn't. You know, don't don't shoot the messenger. It just is what it is. And we were sitting in this room and there was they were planning this event, which was very simple. It was Eucharistic adoration, a band. That's about it. I mean, there wasn't really it wasn't like there was some secret recipe. And but everyone had to discern, 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 discern. Anyway, everyone's praying. And four or five different people kept saying, well, the Holy Ghost is explaining, to, is telling me we need to do this. Well, the Holy Ghost is telling me we need to do that. I remember thinking to myself, do we think the Holy Ghost has a divided will? Um, so either it's just you and it's just your thoughts, or if it is spiritual, it's definitely not of God. What would you think about that? Yeah, I mean... Uh, two, two, uh, two contrasting truths cannot exist simultaneously in the same way. They, they, you can't have that. And so what you're saying at best is it's neutral, at least in, in, the, in the sense of an interpretation. At best, it's neutral. At best, it's just your own thoughts. Yeah. And I think uh, even, even there, there's, I don't really think that there's much good that can be pulled from it in all honesty, you know, when you're, I, I couldn't help but, and, you know, chuckle to myself a little bit when you're talking about the, uh, you know, the apostles and, uh, you know, what happened on Pentecost and how some people perceived them. Uh, there's name, some, name a group of people that were more filled with the Holy spirit to use the terminology than the apostles mm -hmm. or, or than any of the authors of sacred scripture. I mean, it was inspired by the Holy spirit, all of sacred scripture. Mm -hmm. St. Paul writes about, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, blah, 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 blah. That is a surrender, but it's not the sense that we just lose all faculties. I think that's one other aspect of the charismatic renewal is when people in the charismatic movement, at least from my discussions and my observations, the, the, their definition of surrender is wrong and their application of surrender is wrong. They think I'm going to surrender and give up. And you, oh, you'll definitely see this in like Pentecostal yes. or evangelical parishes. I'm going to give up my bodily autonomy yeah. and I'm not going to control it. That is not surrender. That is not even close to surrender. It's a surrender of the will in a manner that says, Lord, I want exactly what you want. So let me behave according to your will. Yeah. That is surrender. And so you see just, and that, what does that do? That points exactly back to the whole intellectual side of things. You need to have a very sound understanding or, I mean, look at me, a very elementary, very simple, small understanding of these definitions and their application in what it is to live a Catholic life. And when you start looking at, okay, so this is what the saints say about surrender. This is what it means to give yourself to God's will. You have to choose the whole time. In fact, you're probably more in control of yourself in moments of surrender than you have right. ever been in your entire life. I think that's a, that's kind of a funny aspect, a way to look at it. Well, I mean, there should be clarity, you know? Um, and, you know, I've, again, I, I've seen things. Like I remember one time, well, this is an aspect of charismatic renewal events that needs to be discussed. Um, it is a fertile breeding ground for sexual confusion. Um, Another one, yeah. It's a huge problem. It's a really big problem. And I know everyone's going to say, well, hold on, or, you know, there's sexual abuse. I'm not talking about sexual abuse in the like, like here's, here, put it this way. If a priest, whether he's traditional, or whatever, if just a priest abuses someone, then we can say that's because he was doing the opposite of what he should be doing. We wouldn't say the environment of faithful Catholicism facilitates abuse. We would say a priest who is a monster, you know, negates the rules, norms, and, and, and laws of Catholicism to do something evil. Just like we would say, you know, for example, doctors have a high, very high percentage of sexually abusing patients. It's not something that's publicized, but if you ask insurance companies, they'll tell you they're one of the highest. Well, of course that would be the case, but that's because they're doing, because they're in such close proximity. But if someone's just practicing, we would never say practicing medicine facilitates abuse. We would say because of the fact that doctors are in close proximity with people in vulnerable states, 
Therefore, if there's a predator, that is a place that's easily accessible for him. But it's not the medicine that does it. Um, but with the charismatic renewal, I remember seeing, you know, we're, these are prayer events and these are teenagers, very hormonal, obviously. Um, intimate with one another. Basically, a lot of the time in these charismatic events, people are, are basically, you know, prophesying, prophesying so-called over each other, telling each other secrets. They're emotional. They're crying. They're basically in some ways confessing their sins, you know, in a sense. Laying hands on each other and getting very, very intimate. And I remember one time looking around one of these, and there's always the lights are very low. That's always very strange. You know, and then the idea is we don't want to be distracted. It's like, well, that's that's weird. So the lights are very low. Yeah, and there's just the ukulele. <laughs> and yeah, there's like would... you know, spotlights going around. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, exactly. So they're just, and I'm thinking to myself, if I walked into this and this wasn't called a religious event, I'd be like, what strange thing is happening right now where all the 17-year-olds and the, or the 20-year-olds, whoever, are having hands on each other and are are weeping. <laughs> it's like, this is, this, there's, it's obvious that something is going to happen here. And if you do look into the history of a lot of the charismatic communities, you can look it up. This is, this is published in like New York Times. This is from the 70s and 80s and onward. Massive scandals out of these places of uh, basically a cult-like sexual abuse phenomenon. Now, again, people will say, well, that's happened in the church writ large. Yes, it has. But it's not Catholicism that facilitates it. Whereas I would say in the charismatic renewal, I don't know how you avoid these things given how people act. What do you think? I'm going to do my best to articulate my thoughts. So forgive me if I stumble and bumble, Kennedy. Um, right. One, I think that you're, you really are onto something with those comments. I, I really think so. Because when you are in that vulnerable scenario, and on the communicate, let's look at the male psyche versus the female psyche. The female psyche becomes more attached to men when the, when they're able to communicate, when they're able to open up, when they're able to have that emotional connection. So problem one, female psyche. Because of the emotional nature of the charismatic renewal, it makes it difficult for a man to master himself and to be in an environment, place himself in an environment that betters him from an intellectual perspective, from a self-mastery perspective. Right. And so the men are not being formed in a manner that is virtuous for their masculine nature. And the women are being encouraged to embrace more of the communication, the, the openness and the emotional aspect. Yes. Weakness and attraction, and um, therefore allowing men to be more open to vice, therefore women having their uh, their intellect clouded. And a little bit of an anecdotal point to this, I'm not going to say which household, but at Franciscan University, there's uh, there's households, not fraternities, so just different yeah. male groups or female groups. It's the same thing, but Catholicized, Catholicized. And the most uh, charismatic households were the ones that had closeted homosexuals in them yeah. for men. And I, I think there's something to be said for that. There, there really is. And I'm not going to say that, you know, they were bad guys. They weren't. Some of them I consider good friends even to this day. And they're, although that they're SSA, same sex attracted, uh, there, many of them are trying to control it and live a chaste life. But it's just interesting that the, most charismatic households at Franciscan were the households that had the most um, homosexuals in them. I'm not going to say active because I don't know, but I, yeah. uh, that's just very unique. It speaks, again, to the nature of the charismatic renewal and who is attracted to those fruits, if that's a good way to say it. Yeah, no, you're right. And that's actually, that's well said. And, um, you know, I remember one time being at one of these events and there was a woman who was like known as there's always these like gurus in the charismatic world. It's like so-and-so is really gifted. I'm like, yeah, really? You know? Okay. I, I, okay. Great. I guess, you know, and, um, and this woman showed up sort of like, she was like the ringer. We've been doing this planning for weeks and then like, Oh, so-and-so is coming. This is going to be awesome. She's really gifted. Yeah. And I was like, okay, whatever. And um, I was standing beside her and she was praying with this young, you know, teenage 20 something year old girl. 
and set m mutters some, and she's got like a little sidekick who's muttering, you know, masha, 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 hush, hush, you know, muttering some words or whatever. And then she starts speaking these words and then runs her hands down the woman's back. And then she falls onto the floor and starts to wriggle around as if she's being electrocuted and like getting stiff and like basically does that for like an hour. I remember it was very, it was like six feet from me. And I was, I was at my post. I was supposed, again, I was not formed at this time. They asked me to be pray with people. I said I would. I learned some more things later, but that was just trying to, you know, help out. And um, so I remember watching this and being like, this is really weird. <laughs> I don't think that's of God. Um, what would someone, I mean, what would someone gain by that? You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. I, I guess people say, well, they really felt it. And it's like, well, those fade. That's feelings. Feelings are, yeah, they're, 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 they fade away. They're, they're futile. They're fickle. And, mm -hmm. um, so at that moment, like, I mean, my only deduction from that could be either some sort of hypnosis of psychological level, or I would have to say some sort of demonic thing, because I mean, what, what could possess someone to on cue wriggle around on the floor for an hour? and basically pass out, but still be having little mini seizures is what it looked like. Um, unless, I mean, unless it was pre-planned, did they get, I don't think it was pre-planned. It wasn't like some, some, some stage event. And, um, and then I, I ended up discovering Father Ripperger at one point, as many have. And, um, and he talked about the charismatic renewal and then some of the hardest cases he's ever had for possessions have been people that were dabbling in the speaking in tongues thing with charismatic renewal because the tongues were from Satan. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, I think one thing to, to just be aware of, and you touched on this, you alluded to it earlier, the, uh, you know, demonic influence isn't just possession. There's tears of demonic influence. You don't Satan or one of uh, a little bit lower down the totem pole, but far smarter than any of us. Uh, yeah. They start small and then they slowly influence. So it's it's uh, it would be it would be silly to knock to knock the the, the presence of Satan or of any demon um, trying to hijack something that was intended to be good. Uh, yeah. God willing, that the movement itself was created with the intention to be good. We'll let others you know come to that conclusion on yeah. their own with their own history reading, but. Um, that's a that's and the same thing goes with the church as a whole. I mean, Pope Leo the Thirteenth, the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary. So there's, and I think that's kind of interesting too, Kennedy. We're here really trying to push for tradition, talking about how that's clearly the best way for somebody to uh, really get to know Jesus Christ and to become saints. But we have seen that Satan is just as present there too so why would and but that's going to be his hardest battleground it's going to yeah. be the toughest place for him to to have victory he's yeah. going to dislike fighting there most but he sees that to be the number one issue at the same time so who's to say that something that seems to be lesser uh, of a um a less successful tool to bring to keep souls in the catholic church to hijack that it just which one's easier to uh to hijack an armored car or a cop car or a 1980s Volkswagen, Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And also, you know, one of the things that we haven't touched upon is the religious indifferentism is very strong within the charismatic renewal because let's be honest, like if you actually look into the history of it, it did, it did start with Pentecostalism um, in like around the year 1900. Um, and there was an actual, there's, a, there's a, a seminal event you can look to, it's in, the, it's in the annals of history and then it was sort of adopted later by Catholics. Um, it's impossible, it's impossible that a movement that would be acceptable to Catholicism would start in a heresy. It's just not how it works. I mean, Protestantism is a heresy. Um, you cannot be saved as a Protestant per se, obviously individuals who knows and ignorance, I don't know, that's a whole other conversation for God's mercy. I'm just saying, following the rules, it's impossible for Protestantism to save your soul. Um, so if something starts in Protestantism, it cannot be Catholic. Um, there are many natural things like, you know, uh, I think pews were not normal for Catholics and then Protestant churches had pews and they thought pews are a good idea, but pews are not a theological statement. <laughs> it's just a way of sitting. Um, 
Obviously, we adopted things from pagans as far as architecture and things like that and, and literary styles, but we didn't adopt any of the religiosity. Um, so you can't adopt the religiosity of a heretic and say this must be good for Catholicism. It just doesn't make any sense. And when you do look into a lot of the charismatic renewal, this is what's been so crazy for me to go full circle back to the SSPX thing. I've had people in my life who I was like in these charismatic groups with who will literally pray over Protestant pastors and with them at like events and say, here, listen to this sermon by Pastor Bob or whatever, you know, from, you know, Bethel, whatever church or something like that. And then if I send them something about the SSPX, they're like, oh, they're not Catholic. And I'm like, what? Didn't you like in the old law? Not the old law of the Old Testament, but in the old canon law, what you've just done in praying with this Protestant, listening to Protestant praise and worship music was actually a mortal sin. It was communicatio in sacris. Like this is a grave offense against God, according to all moral theologians, essentially until 50 years ago. I mean, if you look into the old manuals about what you're allowed to do when you go to a non-Catholic ceremony, um, you are allowed to attend for a reason of charity or whatever, a funeral, something to do with an affair of the state or something like that. Um, but you're not allowed to do any prayer postures for anything that is not a Catholic prayer. So if you were to go to an Anglican service and they were to say the Our Father and stand, you could stand, but you're not supposed to say it with them because the standing is just sort of not to stand out and be awkward. But at the time of consecration, you can't kneel because it's not the Eucharist. It's idolatry. Right. Um, if you were to go to some you know, non-denominational place, and the pastor says, everyone bow your heads and we're going to call in the name of Jesus, etc. You can't do that because that's a Protestant form of prayer. Um, so I guess, you know, again, this is one of those areas where if we go back full circle to the beginning of our conversation, we have within the church groups that are massive, like the charismatic renewal. Again, many amazing people in it, but there are theological problems who have been objectively speaking, pushing religious indifferentism ecumenism in the bad sense for the last 50 or 60 years who are influential on the Pope. I mean, the Pope's preacher, uh, Raniero Cantalamessa is a charismatic and he's renowned for it. He's a heretic now. He's a universalist. He's like a father, Richard Rohr. Um, you know, um, more things that I could say, you know, continuing. And that's just there happening all the time, but people want to focus on these minutia about, you know, canonical, whatever. Okay. Last thing as we finish here, because we've kind of criticized the charismatic renewal, but I want to end with, you can maybe say why traditionalism was the fulfillment of all your desires. As someone who's looking for the charismatic renewal, looking for tradition, what, what was that thing that you found it? Because you've said it's the most measured. What made you find traditional Catholicism and say, okay, my heart can be at rest now uh, compared to that sort of chaotic feeling you had with the charismatic renewal? Sure. Thank you. And again, I know I know I've already said it once, but just thank you again for letting me come on. I've had a I've had a blast. It's been really nice to have this discussion. I think it was really, really good. Um, simply put, virtue. That's the best way to say it. You find yourself in the TLM, specifically the mass uh, where we find the source and summit of our faith, the Holy Eucharist. Even somebody that's been going for 50 years has those days where they just can't get the ants out of their pants. And at the end of the day, this walk on earth, which is thy ship, not thy home, is all about purging sin from oneself. And boy, do I have a lot of sin to personally purge. Oh man, sometimes I just wonder how it's going to happen. And it's through God's grace, of course, but you'll find that in the TLM and in the traditional practices of the faith. Because you have to control yourself. You have to constantly focus. It's a practice of self-mastery. And if that's what you have to do in order to purge sin so that you can be a perfect and holy vessel for the, our Lord to be, to make it his, self, his self a home in, make himself a home in, then you're going to find that most of all in the TLM. It is hard. It's hard to have the missal, you know, Father Lassans or whatever, whatever one you choose to read through it all. It's hard to stay kneeling. It's hard to stay focused, especially with children. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But that's where one grows. You grow in moments of trial. You grow in holiness in moments of uh, 
sensations of solicitude, look at the dark night of the soul where you don't yeah. feel any of God's presence whatsoever. That's where a person excels. You excel when you're at the gym and you're curling the you're curling and you just are suffering. You excel when you're running, when you're all out of breath and you can't feel your legs anymore. You excel when you're in school because you're just sick and tired of studying and you'd rather be doing something else. The lower represents the higher. And it's you start off by making your bread your bed one day, the next day you're David Goggins and you're running 100 miles with broken toes. That but and that's that's what you find in the TLM. It's it's no joke. It's a self mastery. And that's it. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a perfect way to end it. And I will add, um, I don't have the book on my screen here, but my other book, uh, Terror of Demons, it's called Reclaiming Tradition. It's Terror of Demons, Reclaiming Traditional Catholic Masculinity. And, you know, I wrote that book basically after I had decided to go the route of tradition. And really everything I write in that book is just basic virtue that is common. And I'm not saying people who go to the TLM are all really virtuous. That, that's again, this is that's like saying everyone who goes to the gym is in really good shape. The point is, is that they're at the gym. Okay. And it has the tools. Um, that's why you go to the TLM. That's why you go to tradition is because the tools are there. And you're a tool. So you have to be there. <laughs> uh, you know, you have to be there. Be, and, and, and going to the tradition is an admission that you need it. People have this perception that people who go to the TLM think they're holy. No, people that go to the whole TLM know they're not holy. Therefore, they, it's, that's why they go. Um, I'm sure there are exceptions, but anyway, generally speaking, that's my impression. And um, uh, it's the opposite narrative of, I'm okay, you're okay. It's the opposite narrative of, well, God loves me, so like I'm just going to be in God's love and like everything's going to be okay. It's like, yes, God loves me. Yes, I trust in providence, but I'm an idiot, so I should probably get better. That's, that's, the, that's the crux of it. Um, but in, in this book, Terror of Demons which you can find in the description of this video as well, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it just is the basics of virtue as espoused by traditional priests the world over for 20 centuries. And I just put it in a form and people go, whoa, my mind is blown. Where'd you learn this? I'm like, this is like four sermons that I made into a book. Literally, that's it. I listened to some sermons on YouTube, Father Ripper and others, put in some anecdotes, found some you know stuff you do as an author to sort of pump it up here and there, made it palatable, made it entertaining. It's just basic virtue. Um, Okay, this has been wonderful, and um, I thank you for coming on, Joe. Again, let us know. Um, tell us um, what's your company called, and, and um, how can they get a hold of you? Sure, uh, amgmoon.com, A-M-G, and then moon.com. I also have a substack called It Stands to Reason, so you can check me out there as well. Thank you, Kennedy, really. Thank no you so much. Okay, send me after this, after I'm done recording here, send me an email with those links to your substack and to your thing, and I'll put them in the show notes. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see this probably on Tuesday at this point. It's getting later in the afternoon. I won't be able to probably edit it till later. Um, if you are in the Chicago area, are there still tickets available just to attend the event? Or is it, there are, right? You can't do the food, but you can attend the event. Yep. That's correct. Yeah, okay. So go to uh, canceled, co is it coalition for canceled priests.org or is it just canceled priest.org? What is it? At cancelledpriests.org, you scroll down, you'll see the big old thumbnail in the middle of the site talking about their second anniversary. Click there, you can fill out the form and uh, purchase some tickets. And if you can't do both days, you can at least do Friday or at least do Saturday. Okay, excellent. Do that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was going to say it's the best thing in the Chicago area besides the deep dish, but I was told while I was there that tavern pizza is actually the good pizza and deep dishes for the tourists. So take that as you will. But anyway, some pizza joke in there somehow. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Kennedy Report. And until next time, God bless.